And there really are four goals to myofunctional therapy. Four goals are we want the tongue, you know, in the proper position. We want people to nasal breathe all day and all night. We want to get their lips sealed all day and all night. And we want to correct any swallowing dysfunction. And we'll continue to mention the importance that the tongue plays on our children's growth and development. If that tongue is not sitting up on the roof of the mouth and not applying that pressure to that upper jaw to support the growth of that upper jaw to become this, you know, nice broad, wide U shape we tend to see more narrow palates, high vaulted palates forming, which then has a direct connection to the development of the nasal cavity as well and impacts the child's ability to comfortably breathe through their nose. 85% of symptoms of sleep disordered breathing in children present like ADD and ADHD, and to the point where trained psychiatrists would not be able to tell them apart. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge, and we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening, and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning, and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Tale of Two Hygienists podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Johnston, and this is episode number 420. I'm not going to lie. I thought long and hard about making a 420 joke just then, and ultimately, I decided, like, I just can't do it. It's not who I am, right? Like, I don't have that kind of funny in me, and I think you all know me to be a little bit more <clears throat> respectable and upstanding of a citizen. So anyways, I just couldn't do it. But welcome into this episode anyway, because you are in for a treat today. I'm so excited for this one. It's the beginning of a series. And so today I have on Heidi and Leslie, two hygienists turned myofunctional therapists who have been working on this space, but in a collaborative way. And you're going to find out more about what I mean by that in a few more episodes, but they've been doing this the right way for several years now. And I'm just, I love what they're doing. Special shout out to Michelle Lee for connecting us. Thanks, Michelle. You are the best. So in this episode, we try to lay the foundation for what's to come in future episodes. I mentioned before on the last episode that it's a five-part series, and it's kind of staged, not this episode, but later ones, depending on where you're at in life. So if you're a baby, if you're a teen, if you're an adult, like what is going on with you? What are some things that we're seeing that are problems? How do we correct it? They do have a business that they're launching to get people access to trainings and teachings very affordably in a way that I think this world needs this. And there's more to come on that in this episode. But if you have any questions about this, if you want to be a myofunctional therapist, if you feel like you need treatment or maybe someone you know needs treatment, please don't hesitate to reach out to them. They are some of the foremost experts in the space. You're going to love this. If you're an educator listening to this, I would ask also, maybe play some of these clips for your students. I don't know what you're teaching in school for the myofunctional therapy space, but some of this is really, really, really good. It might light that fire under that one student who might just really understand their role in life because they heard this show. So I encourage that and thank you in advance for doing that. Now, next week, we have part one of a two-part kind of series within a series, I guess, called Mayo for Babies, where they're going to bring in a special guest who is a lactation consultant, and you are just going to fall in love with this little mini series within the series. They are so good about walking us through the steps, telling us all of the pitfalls, solutions, all of that. It's going to be awesome. You're going to have a great time. I, I just, I can't say enough good things about this journey that you're about to be on for the next five weeks. It's going to be the best thing ever. So for me personally, I'll be at the Chicago Midwinter in a few weeks doing some recordings at the Endeavor Business Media booth. I think that's in the guide if you want to look us up. I think it's in the 1300s. I can't remember exactly what the number is, but that's a huge upgrade. If you think about like where we came from when we were, I don't remember if this was 2016 or 2017, but we were under the escalators. And you could hear that in every recording. So I'm very excited to be at a booth. Uh, please stop by, say hi, take a picture if we're not recording and all these different, or I mean, if we're recording, come take a picture too. And then separate from that, if you have time, 
please sign up for our newsletter. All you have to do is head over to our website at taleoftwohygienists.com and fill out the information in the pop-up that's going to appear. Now, if you exit out, that pop-up might not come back. I think we have settings on there, so it does like not spamming you all the time for your contact information. So if you're using the same browser, it probably won't be there. But if you just go into a different browser, go to that website again, it'll come up and you can put your information in. We write some really funny, clever, also informative newsletters. So I would love for you guys to be a part of that. Also, I have a tip episode coming out this week on influencers and influencer culture. Candidly, I haven't written my talking points out for that yet. So I don't know kind of where I'm going to be, whether I'm going to be incredibly aggressive or whether I play the peacemaker because it kind of depends on my mood and who's going <laughs> to who's going to come at me between now and then, then it's kind of just influenced my mood of whether I think influencers are good or not. I kind of lean towards not, but whatever that's, that's for Friday's episode. So make sure you guys come back for that. Uh, that is all for me for this week. I hope you are all staying healthy. See you on Friday for that tip episode. Thank you so much. And please welcome Heidi and Leslie. A tale of two hygienists. All right, everyone, welcome into the interview portion of the podcast. As I mentioned, kind of on the intro, we have this really amazing series we're going to bring to you over the next about month or so on myofunctional therapy. This is something that we've done in the past. You all have just continue to, to ask for it. And so here it is. It took us a long time to find the right people, though. And I'm really excited by our guests, Heidi and Leslie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. So, you know, one of the first questions that we always try and get into is just a little bit about uh, each one of you, because I think as we go through these, this four part series, people are going to want to know more. They're going to probably zero in on maybe who they connect with more, like either personality wise or specialty wise, or kind of what your passions are and things like that. So do you both mind? Let's just jump in like, you know, who you are, you know, kind of how you got into the space. Sure. Yeah. Heidi, you want you me to go, go first, first? Leslie? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so my background is a dental hygienist uh, for going on 23 years now and specializing in more integrative dentistry for the last, you know, half of my career, basically, and attending, you know, the AOSH and these different that looked at more, you know, the holistic integrative health, which I became very passionate about. And so I took my first airway course over 10 years ago before it was even under the scope of dentistry, but it was something I really jumped on. I went before the main dental board back in 2013 to present myofunctional therapy and, and to see, you know, about hygienists being able to practice in the state of Maine. And then it kind of evolved from there. I ended up having a family, took a little bit of a break from it and got really into it um, years ago. So yeah, I really love it. I did help I will say I helped open an airway practice um, a couple of years ago with a dentist and I started a medical professional study group. I started working with two osteopathic doctors right away. I knew that I wanted to connect the whole body to the airway, that I had a small piece of it, but I needed other people that had the other components. And so I started working with two osteopaths and we met every two weeks, basically for almost two years. And then I had wanted to start a study group, but I was really hesitant and nervous, you know, for some reason. <laughs> and finally, they kind of put the pressure on me, like, let's do this. And so I now have a study group that I've had for a couple of years now. And we have close to 50 medical professionals from we have an ENT, we have lactation consultants, we have physical therapists, chiropractors, um, nutritional you know, we just, we have a wide array, functional doctors, our osteopathic doctors, and more and more people wanting to get into this group, you know, all the time. So it's really wonderful. That's awesome. I, I think a lot of people are like, let me dip my toe in. And you're like, no, nope, we're just going to go for it. <laughs> we're going to go more and more and more and more. I don't do anything, <laughs> you know, halfway. If I go into something, if I'm passionate about it, I tend to go, you know, all in. So which can be like good or bad. <laughs> that is Heidi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leslie, let's talk a little bit about you. Yeah. So I'm also a registered dental hygienist and I'm going into my 17th year of practicing. I got into kind of airway more tongue tie 10 years ago when I had my first daughter who was born with a tongue tie. And being a hygienist, you would think I would know 
how to identify that or what that looked like. And instead I was a you know mom struggling to nurse my baby and had no idea until she started crying. And I was like, oh, her tongue looks like a heart. That's not supposed to be how it looks. And after dealing with the challenges of that and having that released, it really kind of is what, again, made me want to look into it more and learn more and realize that we don't have enough knowledge around how the connection of these tongue ties really impacts like our children. And from there, it was a rabbit hole that again, like Heidi said, you kind of start to dive in and you learn some of it and you just want to keep learning more and more. And that was the start to it. And then about five years ago, I started and developed the myofunctional therapy program at the dental office that I was working at and just really took off from there with the connections and then getting to get connected with Heidi again, you know, more recently in her study group and getting connected with all of those providers and realizing the impact that collaboration and the network really has was really taking things to another step for me. Now, how far are you from each other as like location wise? 40 minutes. Isn't that interesting that two people with like this kind of a passion are real? I mean, you guys are within driving distance. You guys would be at each other's house in an hour if you had to. Like how fortuitous is that? Yeah, it was. So Leslie and I actually have known each other for, I don't know, Leslie, since 2014, I think you came, yeah. uh, we met, we worked together for eight years and then I went my own way and she had stayed at the practice she was at, but I, we knew we wanted to work together. We had actually like talked about it. The timing was just off. And then we reconnected through the study group, knowing kind of, we were actually working with mutual providers and stuff. And the providers were like, oh, do you know Leslie? I'm like, yeah, I know Leslie <laughs> and, and vice versa. So like, and so, yeah, I actually, when I decided that I wanted to go out on my own and I wanted to, I had this idea for Myo2 Health. We didn't know what it was named at the time, but this more self-guided program. I knew I wanted Leslie to work with me on that. It's not something I felt like she was just amazing. She's, you know, so smart and just brings a lot to the table. And I knew I wanted a partner like that. So I was really excited when she was on board with doing this adventure with me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so good. So let's set up the what the next couple of episodes are going to look like for our listeners. So we've, yeah. we've talked about this before and there's you guys, by the way, are one of the most organized group of people I've ever worked with. So the the way I think that a lot of people process things is by being able to put things in buckets, right? And so do you mind kind of going over what like this episode and then the next three episodes are going to look like? Yeah, sure. We kind of set that up so that breaking it up into the different categories with starting and just giving the listeners an introduction to what is myofunctional therapy. A lot of people you say that word and they're like, what did you just say? So kind of giving an understanding of what myofunctional therapy is, who can benefit from that, what that looks like is what we really wanted people to get kind of an understanding of, you know, to start out this series. And then I think we wanted to kind of break it up into how we identify that when we work with babies, what that looks like in, you know, addressing tethered oral tissues in babies, how that impacts their function of being able to feed, breathe, swallow, and then the third segment that we kind of broke up into was more our children and the impacts that that has on the growth and development of our children. Uh, same thing, breathing, their sleep, their speech, craniofacial development of the jaws. And so we wanted people to kind of have an understanding of how that affects our pediatric population. And then we also have our adult population, which same thing are when these patients come to Heidi and I. And at that point, they have become more symptomatic patients. They're usually dealing with mm -hmm. some type of muscle pain, headaches, postural, you know, discomfort, um, sleep breathing disorders. And uh, there's kind of a whole category oh, of what that could, yeah, what that breaks into, you know, the TMJ issues, jaw pain, all of that. So kind of breaking it up so that kind of the different ages understand and identify what, you know, these things look like, what the symptoms may be, how can they can be addressed and going from there. Which is going to be really great because I think you, know, you go to general practice and some pra practices are geared towards pediatrics, as we know, and some are kind of geared towards like, we'll never see children ever if we don't have to. And then there's some that are just kind of like everything, like everywhere in between. And so I think if you are, as, as a hygienist, are listening to this and you're thinking, okay, well, like, this is like the subset of the population that I treat primarily, they, there's going to be an episode for me. But I think what's key about it is I, I would say, and this is probably wrong but like i would say that a lot of the stuff that 
can be fixed, can be fixed young, can be identified young. The problem is people weren't looking for it. And so now we have all these adults that are kind of screwed up, right? And that's what most of us see is like, okay, how do we fix an adult? How do we fix an adult? But if we can teach people to start looking for the signs and symptoms earlier, then I think we'll have a healthier population. So I'm really excited that this is going to be for everybody. But this first episode, like we, like you said, is going to be kind of like an intro to like, what is myofunctional therapy? Like, what does a therapist do and all that kind of stuff? So where should we start with that? I think with just what is myofunctional therapy? So like we were saying, some people might not even know or understand what that concept really is. So myofunctional therapy, to simplify it, I think we would say it's a form of physical therapy that really addresses the muscles from the neck up. That's kind of the area that we specialize in. So when you go through and have training on myofunctional therapy, you're learning about what those muscles, like ideal function is, right? So when you go through and treat patients, you're looking at where are those symptoms coming from? Are these people compensating and using some of the muscles more than they really should be and not using their tongue and other muscles as much as we would want. And so you're going through and retraining the muscles to have coordination, to have tone and the development that they need to work an idealized function through a process of neuromuscular re-education, getting the brain activated to think about using those muscles. And then also disengaging the muscles that we don't want compensating and doing all this extra work. That's usually what's triggering some of the pain and discomfort that patients will be dealing with. And there really are four goals to myofunctional therapy. Um, The four goals are we want the tongue, you know, in the proper position. We want people to nasal breathe all day and all night. We want to get their lips sealed all day and all night. And we want to correct any swallowing dysfunction. All right. So uh, you guys are mentioning that, you know, working with all the muscles and and things of the head and the neck. (laughs) I, I don't want to say that I've forgotten everything that I, know, I need to know about like anatomy class, but do you feel like as you're learning this, if you're becoming a myofunctional therapist, like you really need to dive back into like the nerve pathways and the musculature again, and really like identify those muscle groups? Absolutely. I think with anything, it's always a continuum of your education. I'm constantly Googling, you know, and we're so fortunate with, you know, the internet today and the access that we have to all the information, you know, so Mm -hmm. whether you're going to CEs or just doing your own research, it's always good. And I think it's one of those things that the treatment, you know, can be very individualized per the client. And so I feel like I'm always learning. I'm learning from my clients and, and our, my, you know, for me, my program is always changing, always like it's not ever staying the same within like way I may be teaching something or what I'm adding to, you know, my program, because I'm learning from my clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I feel like often there's even times where something's happening and I don't even have the answer 100% at that point. And I have to say, I don't know why I'm going to go figure this out though. And that's where it is great that when you take some of these courses, you build a community with other myofunctional therapists or even same thing with having Heidi that I collaborate with now, having somebody to go and be like, have you seen this before? Like what's, you know, this and kind of helps you be able to go back to your patient and really make sure that you are giving that individualized care. Kind of gives you like a little bit of a challenge too. Like you have to like keep pushing yourself and decide. So I think a lot of us get kind of bored with the monotony and like, this is a great opportunity to, you know, not have that, but I got you guys like way off track. Sorry. Can we, let's, let's go back. So we, we had the four goals. We finished the four goals, right? Yes. Yes. I think we finished that. And then just a little background in airway and dentistry, because I think a lot of people are surprised when they go to their dental office and maybe they're being asked questions about sleep and, you know, sleep got put under the or airway, not sleep airway got put under the scope of dentistry back in 2017. You know, right now, though, only 1% of dental professionals are actually doing anything with airway. It's not something mm-hmm. that we're taught in schools, you know, so you do have to take the specialized training. And I think one thing that's hard right now is it would be great if everyone had myofunctional therapy training, but realistically, we're in a shortage right now with hygienists. And so I think that's where, again, an area that we saw a gap in that we want to help offices that maybe want to have something, you know, an airway practice in their offices, but don't have someone on staff that does myofunctional therapy. And it's epidemic. The research is showing 80% of people have airway problems. 
you know, the book Breath by James Nestor, you know, really brought a lot of that to light to mainstream. But I think if you talk to people, you know, in the field, they say it's even greater, you know, number than that. And I think that coincides with our children, you know, the population of kids who now need orthodontics. That statistic is also 80 percent. And that goes hand in hand as we're going to go into later on. Why does, you know, our tongue play a huge role if kids need braces? We talked a little bit kind of at the the outset of, you know, who's going to who who are we going to be talking about in each of these like sessions that we're going to be doing. But do you mind going in again about, you know, who would benefit really from myofunctional therapy? I think if you ask Heidi and I, we'd say everyone. <laughs> we, we want, you're we looking want at me right now. You're like, Andrew, you need my like you do. You can't, you can't help it. It's hard. <laughs> you go everywhere and it's like, oh, I, you could see it because it is such like Heidi's saying. I mean, it's an epidemic that we're kind of dealing with right now with how, you know, so many things have changed and the way that we eat our mm -hmm. foods and, how, you know, processing things and all of that stuff. But really, I mean, breaking it down. And when I kind of work with my babies that I work with, I always explain to parents that this truly is something that starts in utero. So it's, a, you know, in through the developmental process of when that midline tissue should be going through a receding process at about 12 weeks old, you know, the, the tissue doesn't fully recede. And so, you know, there's this band of tissue that for some just stays a little bit tighter down to the floor of the mouth. And so that's when, again, that every baby's different. They can maybe adapt and work around that. A mother might be able to have more adaptability with how she can feed, but it, you know, you really start looking at how does this impact their, their feeding, their breathing, their swallowing, and then children. So children, I work with a lot of speech pathologists who same thing have been maybe working with children for a year. And they're like, I have been trying to get this child to make this sound. And it just seems so difficult for them to be able to do like what is going on. And when I get in there and do the exam and actually start looking at their inability to position their tongue in the correct positions to even be able to make those sounds, I'm like, well, we don't have the right muscles working to be able to, to do that. So um, looking at children and again, you know, as Heidi's mentioned a couple times too, and we'll continue to mention the importance that the tongue plays on our children's growth and development. If that tongue is not sitting up on the roof of the mouth and not applying that pressure to that upper jaw to support the growth of that upper jaw to become this, you know, nice broad wide U shape, we tend to see more narrow palates, high vaulted palates forming, which then has a direct connection to the development of the nasal cavity as well and impacts in a child's ability to comfortably breathe through their nose, which then can often be why children are mouth breathing more. So there's a lot of things too. And again, like we were saying, like children, if, you know, there's one thing that I could push for is just like educating parents and providers to really understand like how this impacts and what, if we don't address these things at this earlier age, the adult symptoms that they're going to end up with possibly 20 years down the road. Mm -hmm. With our adults, you know, we see a progression, like I had airway issues from childhood. And so, and it changes our, you know, children usually aren't going to have, they can, but they're not typically going to have the headaches and the jaw pain. That's what we see kind of come out later on. But I think it's a really interesting statistic that 85% of symptoms of sleep disordered breathing in children can present like ADD and ADHD. And to the point where trained psychiatrists would not be able to tell them apart. I developed ADD symptoms in my 30s, and I had never had ADD as a kid. I had brain fog. I had something called upper airway resistance, my short-term memory, to the point where I actually went to my doctor because I was concerned, and I was tested and put on Adderall. I wore a night guard for 20 years. I developed anxiety in my teens that developed more into panic attacks in my 20s and stuff. And so again, I, your sleep cycles play such a huge role in your fight or flight, your autonomic nervous system. And one thing that I really have learned from the osteopaths that I work with and all the other medical providers is I think that our program is a little different is that we actually include a lot of autonomic nervous system regulation. And I started doing this a couple of years ago. I was actually working with a dentist and who she had an aura ring and she was working with a functional doctor and she could not control her heart rate variability. It was showing she was always in fight or flight. And I had already been kind of doing some work around that for myself because I had fixed myself. I had corrected. I got rid of my night guard. I got rid of ADD. <laughs> I was sleeping better, but my anxiety was still, you know, an issue. And I started working with these osteopaths and 
you know, how to regulate my autonomic nervous system. And I taught her a technique that, and I started doing research on my own and I wasn't going to actually include this in my program, but it changed her life so profoundly. And she's like, you have to start teaching this to other people. And so it's just developed from there because our sleep is so important. If we miss one hour of sleep, that daylight savings time, this research shows that when we lose one hour of sleep, there's an increase of 27% of heart attacks and strokes and the exact opposite when we gain that hour, a decrease in that number. So if you think about what the lack of sleep does to our bodies long term, it can be so minuscule that people have just gotten used to not sleeping good that they don't even know that there's a problem. So you're a fan of the the legislation to get rid of daylight savings time. Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. You're like, it's killing people. We need to stop. It literally is killing. <laughs> it's literally killing people. Yeah. So, and the sad thing is, is like when I talk to people, like when I was practicing as a hygienist and screening people, you know, I would look in their mouth and I could tell just by looking in your mouth, if you sleep good or not. And I would ask you, how's your sleep? And a lot of people would say, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. And I think in my head, you haven't slept good in so long that you don't even know what good sleep is. Yeah. yeah it's just yeah. one of those things that you don't know that's normal for them. So, you know, you ask that question and they're like, it's fine. And then I ask more questions and they're like, yeah, I wake up like five times a night and, you know, can't get out of bed in the morning, all these things. That's not, you know, quality sleep right there. And they think it's so normal. I mean, that's, right. it's sad, but I mean, I think even us, right? Like we're healthcare providers, but we, I think about last night, I, I didn't get great sleep again. I'm like, mm, that's no, that's just par for the course. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to ask this kind of like a little bit out there question. So you, throughout this conversation so far, you've mentioned a lot of other specialties or other groups that you have to work with. And it seems like, uh, may, and again, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm wrong all the time, but like, I feel like the narrative sometimes for myofunctional therapy is like you go to a myofunctional therapist and they're going to fix you. And what I'm hearing from you both is like, no, 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 we're going to work with you and we're going to try and do our best, like get you to a certain point. But there are also other people in this space that you're going to need to work with probably to kind of get the the bigger picture, the holistic picture complete. Is that mm -hmm. an accurate assessment? Yes, absolutely. I like to say I'm your quarterback. And this is, again, part of the reason why we developed this study group is because I want to work with like minded individuals that, you know, could put ego aside and understand that we all have a part of the puzzle piece and that it's really that collaboration of working together for the betterment of our patients and, you know, really trying to get away from pharmaceuticals and, you know, just prescribing things and getting to the root cause of things. And, and that's what's one thing that is amazing is like we have developed this amazing network of people that the people and we actually have, you know, put a lot of them through myofunctional therapy. So they really understand like and have seen the changes themselves that, you know, we all collaborate and work together for our patients. And so it's it's really amazing. I want to because we're kind of running a little bit short on time. I, I, I want to talk about very specific things that I think the everyday hygienist is, it knows about, like, you know, tongue tie, mouth breathing, swallowing issues and things like that. If I can put that, like we'll put a pin in that for a minute, we'll come back to it if we have more time a little bit later, because I want to jump to, I want to talk about some of the techniques that we need to become familiar with for therapy. Yeah. So when we go through and design kind of the therapy program for patients, Again, we try to very individualize that, but it's really about starting kind of at a foundational point. You really have to, I kind of always describe it to patients, it's like building blocks. Like you can't just jump into being able to all of a sudden, you know, have the correct swallowing pattern when we haven't actually been reconditioning the strength of the tongue and getting the tongue to learn elevation and back of the tongue, you know, being able to lift up and the lateral borders of the tongue to be able to engage. And so you really break it down into a series of kind of exercises, which I think, you know, both Heidi and I are very similar in our programs of that. You kind of work on a couple of exercises that are specifically targeting, you know, a set muscle group at that point. And those patients end up getting kind of like homework exercises that they're going to have to practice because that's where that neuromuscular re-education really comes in is that it's a matter of, we can't just do it with you once every couple of weeks and your muscle's going to be stronger. You have to go home and actually practice these series of exercises, ideally a couple of times a day, so that it's really strengthening, again, the re-education of the neuromuscular aspect is there, so that when we see patients again in a, you know, usually a couple of weeks, 
we're seeing, okay, let's see that progress that you've made in creating that muscle tone there. And now once they have that strength, we can then give another set of exercises that kind of builds on that to say, okay, well, now we're going to take it to this next step and try to do this and, you know, work on those exercises. And part of also what we do is the patient has to look in the mirror. They have to be able to see themselves because especially our adults usually will have a lot of compensations. So they might be doing an exercise and there's a lot of neck engagement, meaning that we're really seeing the neck muscles like pop out, especially your clenchers and grinders, you know, or there's a lot of movement in the jaw. Everything we want to try to stabilize and disengage all the muscles that are just being overused and overworked. And that's really where you're gonna see a lot of release of the tension in the head and neck, headaches going away, jaw pain going away, that type of stuff. Yeah, such a great point. It's it's interesting because I, I, you know, when I would look, I don't know, again, I don't know anything about this, but I always thought it would be more of like, uh, can you reach this with your tongue or can you do like this circus act or whatever? I, can you Can you do these things? And yes or no, but you're talking about uh, like a whole nother layer of of exams than I think that I, I would have expected. Well, and I think that's really a good point, Andrew, because I was a class four tongue tie. And as a dental hygienist, class four is the, you know, worst <laughs> tongue tie you can have. And never did I think I had an issue with my tongue range of motion because I was more posteriorly tongue tied. And so those are more hidden. I think everyone, you know, thinks when they think of tongue tie, they think, and I've had a few of these patients and Leslie has probably seen a few babies where it's like literally very restricted and tied, you know, to the bone, but that's not the typical, the typical one is more hidden. And so we have to, you know, look a little deeper. Love it. All right. So I think we have time probably for, just, I, I know I want to get to all of this, but I want to go back to mouth breathing a little bit more because it's kind of a funny joke that we call people mouth breathers when they're just not the smartest. And you, you touched on it a little bit, but do you guys mind going into just a little bit about kind of like how myofunctional therapy would treat mouth breathing? We have to look at multiple things when it's a mouth breather, whether it's a, you know, child or an adult, you know, the longer that they've been a mouth breather, there may be more issues with, you know, we might want to involve an ENT to look up and see, you know, any child who has enlarged tonsils and adenoids, it's usually an indication that there's some mouth breathing going on and it might just be at nighttime. And so this was, you know, me, I was an okay nasal breather during the day, but I was a mouth breather at night. And that coincides with the clenching and grinding, which we can kind of go into in another segment, but you know, the, we really need to one, make sure that someone can mouth breathe. And so doing a quick test of having them hold like maybe a tongue depressor and see if they can hold that for two to three minutes, you know, is a good way to just see, you know, how long can they do? Is it just a habit? or can they literally not breathe, you know, through the mouth? And if the tongue, when your mouth is open, the tongue is low in the mouth. And the things that we screen for, you know, in clinical settings is, you know, is, is there a physical tethering that tongue tie Leslie was talking about earlier, or is it more of a habit that is formed that the tongue is just low in the mouth that may have to do with their swallow? low tongue tone, that type of thing, but they both are just red flags to us that there's potentially a bigger issue. That if the tongue cannot get up to the roof of the mouth with the lips closed during the day, it's not going to do that at nighttime. And so what happens at night is that tongue is going to go back into the airway and obstruct the airway. But also you got to think of what Leslie said, when the tongue is not up to the roof of the mouth, it's not creating the pressure on that upper jaw for that growth and development. And the roof of your mouth is the floor of your nasal cavity. So if your upper jaw is underdeveloped, your nasal cavity is going to be underdeveloped. And what happens is kids who are mouth breathers from a young age, when they develop, their facial features are actually going to be longer. Um, they're not going to have much, you know, definition in their jawline and cheekbones. They're going to have more of a forward head posture, which is also going to obstruct their airway. They're lower jaw is going to the upper jaw drives how their lower jaw is going to develop so if the upper jaw is underdeveloped the lower jaw is going to be underdeveloped and can grow more retronathic into the airway as well and most deviated septums do not happen because of trauma they have to do with the growth and development of the facial features and so 
all of these like mouth breathing from a young age, now that we know what we know, if we can catch it early, it changes that child's life. This is really like a quality of life, whether you're an infant and trying to nurse or a young mother that, you know, is struggling to nurse to these kids who are um, their emotional resilience, maybe they have extreme highs and extreme lows. You know, these are all things that we see with breathing and airway or you're an adult and you're, you know, have a lot of anxiety or you're just not sleeping good. You know, all of these things play a role in how we operate on a day to day basis. You mentioned about uh, tonsils and adenoids, and I feel like it, the conventional thing growing up, at least during my age, was that you know if you're having that inflammation, if you're having issues with with breathing or constriction, like let's get those tonsils out, let's get those adenoids out. It seemed like it's such a quicker, easier fix than having to go through any sort of like long term therapy. Is that changing, or is that still kind of readily prescribed? I think it's definitely changing. I mean, we want to, if you remove the tonsils and adenoids and you haven't gone to the root cause, those tissues can grow back. And so you might get a short term relief and see a change, but then I've worked with patients that have had the tonsils grow back and stuff. And so even working with our ENT, their first reaction is not to remove the tonsils and adenoids, you know, those, they play a role in our immune systems and stuff. And so we want to try to, to not do surgeries like and be mm-hmm. as non-invasive as possible, but there are times that we do have to remove those, especially if they're, you know, class three, class four tonsils are really restricting that person from moving forward with, you know, therapy because they literally cannot, you know, breathe, you know, through their nose. You mentioned how kind of like relatively new this discipline kind of is within dentistry, but, you know, I would say as like a little bit of a pushback, you know, I don't know, are the ENTs that you surround yourself with are probably like really high caliber, really like they study this stuff. They really like get into it. Do you feel like all ENTs are kind of on the same level now, or is it still kind of a progression for them just like it is for us? Yeah, I would say it's definitely a progression. And, you know, I would, I, we have wonderful ENTs in our community, but again, it's really kind of come back to that networking and like the study group that has been created to almost educate each other on how like our fields can, you know, like kind of work well together with each other and educating those ENTs on how we can be looking at this differently and not need to jump to such a surgical approach. And so I think it's once we actually found like our network of who are our like-minded providers, that that's who we stick to because sometimes, you know, you want patients to be able to go and obviously hopefully hear similar messages about the importance of being a nasal breather. And that's where, when we talk about this mouth breathing, it's like, not just because we don't want people walking around with their mouth hanging open, looking like, ah, it's, because there are so many benefits to breathing through your nose that I just don't think people even realize that there's a reason that you you know we should be using our nose to breathe, not our mouth. And and it's getting providers and the ENTs to kind of recognize that and understanding the bigger picture of like, again, you can remove adenoids and tonsils, but if you're not addressing that root cause, that tissue can just grow right back again. So it's not going to be a long-term result. That's a good point. I don't think there's any, I, I mean, I'm sure you go in like, I'm a dental hygienist. Um, by the way, what you're recommending me is wrong. I, I'm sure it's not the way to go about it, but I, th- I still think there is some like, you know, inner disciplinary coll- collaboration we need to be having. So like, if you are concerned about these things and you're hearing two different stories, like, I don't think it's wrong to maybe educate them. So I, I guess kind of like as, as we're closing out, first of all, you guys are doing really, really cool stuff. And I want to talk about that in a minute, but just the future of of myofunctional therapy, like where is it headed? What it, what can we expect in the future? I think there's more awareness coming out in the communities and stuff. I have had patients reach out to me and because they've done their own research and stuff, which is just amazing, you know, and stuff. So I think that you're going to hear more and more about it. That's our goal. I know, you know, there's many groups doing what we're doing, but Leslie and I are very passionate about education, whether it's medical professionals, dental professionals, or just, you know, people in general, we want to get this information out. We want them questioning, you know, and asking, are there alternative ways that we could be treating instead of you know, not either having answers or going to pharmaceuticals. All right. Let's tell the listeners kind of the cool stuff that you're doing, how they can find you and all of that. Yeah. So we are doing some really cool stuff that Heidi and I are very excited about. One of the things that is kind of in the works right now is over the past couple of months, we've been working on recording 
almost over 80 videos of content of myofunctional therapy exercises and kind of the information that we've been talking about during this episode of like what those exercises look like, but also what the compensations that go along with those exercises can look like, things with regulating our autonomic nervous system, breathing techniques, you know, even things from how to blow your nose, how do we do nasal hygiene, sleep hygiene. So we're compiling all of these videos to try to put a platform together that will make it so that people, no matter where they are or what their financial means are, can have access to this information. I think that's a big thing that both Heidi and I, you know, see currently in our practices. And when we, you know, started collaborating together and got talking about, like we mentioned, we see this in everyone. So, I mean, we want people to really be able to have this knowledge. And even if that's just an introduction to realize that maybe they need you know, more assistance and need that one-on-one -on -one therapy. We very much, you know, advocate for that as well, but wanting people to have the means of having kind of a, a platform that can get them started on this journey to better health. No. So I think, you know, one thing that we're again, very passionate about is how can we benefit the most people? How can we make the barriers, you know, break down those barriers. So the cost, the location, and how can we help dental professionals provide myofunctional therapy, per, you know, if they don't have someone in office doing it. So this will be an online platform that patients can either get through our website or they, you know, maybe their medical or dental provider has guided them towards us. And it's a starting point. It may not be the end game. They may need to work one on one with a myofunctional therapist, but that is where Leslie and I, you know, can come in. We do telehealth. I we both treat people all over the country, and uh, you know, or we can link them up with someone you know closer in their community. So they can find us at myo2health.com um, on Instagram, myo2health.com. They can also email us. We have email at info at myo2health.com as well as personally, you can email to myself at Leslie at myo2health.com and then Heidi at myo2health.com as well. And the website's in the works right now and we hope to continue to keep you loading more content onto it and especially as this platform does launch and we offer this, you know, online self-guided platform. So they'll be more to come with that as well yeah this is a tale a tale oh yeah a tale of two hygienists so there might be only one bringing the best of dental knowledge and we do it all with ease we cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease we're gonna do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist a tale of two hygienists